My name is Dr. Yosef Wakwaya. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician based in Dallas. Got into medicine around the end of high school. I became a pulmonary and critical care doctor. Ultimately, I realized that I love the lungs and I realized how much we didn't know about so many different lung diseases. When it comes to the makeup of the patients that I see with COPD, as far as race goes, it's a mixed group that I end up seeing. Um, but the more unifying characteristics that I see is the age tends to be in the sixth or later decade of life. And then there's a profound history of cigarette smoking um, that leads to that slowly developing shortness of breath that can be associated with cough and wheezing. Smoking cessation is one of those things that will help improve mortality or will help patients live longer in COPD. So I do address that and talk about, hey, if there are things that we want to stick around for, you know, there are loved ones in our life, there are goals that we want to accomplish. This is going to be something that we have to do, but we don't have to do it alone. I provide resources like the Quit Line, um, which now also has an app and they have counselors that have most of them are former smokers who have quit themselves and can relate to the struggle that they're going through. And I try my best to provide medications and alternatives to nicotine uh, that can help them break that addiction. The biggest challenge is that a pulmonary sarcoidosis can look like many things. And so in the community, um, it can be tough to get a clear answer. And so I'm often not the first lung doctor that people have seen, and I'm definitely not the first physician people have seen. Sometimes they've seen an infectious disease, a hematologist because there's concern for malignancy or something like a lymphoma. And sometimes it also gets misdiagnosed. Sometimes they find a granuloma. and finding that in the right situation is key to the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And there are several things that can lead to granulomas. Certain autoimmune diseases can cause granulomas. Exposure to mold can, uh, or fungus or even infections with cousins of tuberculosis or tuberculosis itself can lead to granulomas. So there's a wide array of things that can look like sarcoidosis and that's the biggest dilemma in diagnosing it. There are so many things that, that are crucial for, for maintaining lung health. One of the things that we need to do is continue to follow up with your lung doctor on a regular basis. Sometimes our lung disease can be progressing or changing without us feeling it. Another thing that's very important is protecting the lungs that you have. Staying up to date with vaccines, particularly for patients who are immunosuppressed and on medications for sarcoidosis is going to be important. We want to preserve the healthy lung tissue that we have and infections or pneumonias can damage that and can sometimes accelerate different types of lung disease. Regular exercise is also going to be important. I often hear patients who tell me that they're active throughout the day. You know, hey, I work and I'm carrying this weight um, or I'm a chef and I'm always on my feet. That's great. But aerobic activity is important. Whenever you stop and take breaks, that gives a chance for your lungs to kind of relax. Unless you push your lungs, you really won't know how well they are or are not doing. And so if you do a daily walk that has some hills and you're, you know, nine months later, boy, man, I am having to take a break at the top of that hill. That says something. And that might clue you in to go see me or your lung doctor a little bit sooner. Asthma's impact in the African-American community is stronger than any other racial group. There's also things about us where we tend to live that predisposes us more to um, allergens that we know that aggravate asthma. Living in highly populated areas also issues with healthcare and access to adequate healthcare because of the past that everybody's had to endure within our community. We don't have that same access that others do. And then that we often use an ER as a primary care where that doesn't routinely push your care forward. That's more kicking the can down the road. It's important for us to establish with the pulmonary care uh, doctors for your asthma because the ER will not be enough. 
and asthma, even if it's mainly mild, can still sometimes be deadly. It is important to um, participate in clinical research, and I think asthma is a great example. In the past decade, the care of asthma has been revolutionized in so many different ways. The ways that we use old tools are, are starting to be redefined. For example, al albuterol as a rescue inhaler um, is now moving out of favor and an inhaler that has a steroid in it as well as albuterol or a cousin of albuterol is being favored. And we've realized that that's because getting that steroid earlier can help prevent exacerbations. And then also, so that's an example of changing how we use old tools. We now have developed um, precision medicine within asthma. And it's through participation in clinical trials that we have been able to identify there are certain groups of asthmatics where we can figure out, hey, this type of asthma is mainly driven by allergies. Hey, this type of asthma is driven by eosinophils, a type of white blood cells. And we have now specific therapies that we can employ that affect just those with that particular um, pathophysiology or disease process. And it's had tremendous effects for patients who are routinely requiring steroids or routinely having exacerbations. And so that is an example of how being involved in clinical trials can transform medicine.